Welcome back, I'm Robert Breaker. We are continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through John, and today, John 15. Can't wait to get into it. Lots to get into, so get your Bible out turn to John chapter 15. And while you're turning to John chapter 15, let me remind you, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Now remember this, this is important. Remember, John writes this book after Paul, okay? So let me see if I can write this up here real quick, make sure you get a hold of this message. Because there's a lot of people, well that really went uphill, but oh well. There's a lot of people out there that want to take a lot that's written in this book and try to force it into today. And when you do that, you get a little bit of a problem. Here's Jesus' birth. You get into false doctrine if you try to force this into today. So we can take the book where it lines up with Paul. Where it doesn't, we have to go, huh. Here's Jesus, and here is where the disciples are, okay? And then Jesus dies here at the cross. So this is what we call the earthly ministry of Jesus. I feel like I'm doing it sloppy today, but I'm doing the best I can. The earthly ministry of Jesus, okay? The New Testament does not start until there's the death of the testator. So the New Testament doesn't start until Jesus dies. Then starts the New Testament. After the New Testament, the early apostles are going out, and we call this time the time of the apostles' doctrine. And this is a time in which they're still dealing with the Jews until they stone Stephen. After that, we see God saying, okay, now we're going to go to the Gentiles. And so then we start to see the apostle Paul. And then we start to see the revelations given to Paul and the mysteries given to Paul. And when you get a hold of those mysteries and revelations of Paul, you get something. You get a lot of truth. Now, John is one of these in this earthly ministry. John writes the book of John way over here after Paul has come on the scene. And he's writing about things that took place there. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were probably written around here sometime about those things. So, as we go through this book and read this book, always remember that this book was the last of the four Gospels written. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written first, probably not long after the time of when it took place. And it's way later, 80, 85, 90 A.D., that John is writing. That's why John as a book is so different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, there are some of the same things discussed, but then there are a lot of other information, different stuff, that is not found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why is that? Well, because sometimes Jesus said something in private to John that only he remembered, like at the Last Supper. Lord, who is it? Who's the one, Lord, that, that's going to be uh, betraying you? And we read and we looked at how Jesus said, the one I give soft to, and nobody else heard that. So there's some of these things that he's writing in the book of John are things that the other disciples didn't hear. Some of the things are said by Jesus publicly to the other disciples, and they don't understand. They're listening to Jesus, and they're going, what did you say? Last time, as we went through chapter 14, there was twice Jesus says something, and someone speaks up and goes, what? One of those was Philip, in verse 9, Philip, or verse 8, actually. Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And the other was Thomas. And Thomas asks a question. So you can clearly, clearly see that uh, they're not understanding everything that Jesus says. And I showed you last time how a lot of the things that Jesus was saying here were only to the Jews during the kingdom message, but also Jesus in the book of John was saying some things about over here. For example, when you're saved, you get eternal life. So this is what rightly dividing the word of truth is all about. And I have to give you that little introduction before we get into this today, because chapter 15 is a chapter that many, 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 many people love to go to to try to prove that you can lose your salvation. And they are so wrong. They are so wrong. They're not rightly dividing. They don't know what they're talking about. So remember that. And also remember that we kind of have a double application here in the book of John. Actually, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because he's writing to Jews, because in his earthly ministry, he's going to Jews, and he's saying the kingdom's going to come. So he's saying, here's the kingdom message, and the kingdom could have come had they accepted him. 
But because they didn't, now the kingdom is way over here, the millennial kingdom. And before the kingdom can come, they've got to go through the tribulation. So the rapture has to come first, then the tribulation, then Jesus comes back at Armageddon, so that then what? Then the millennial kingdom can come. So as we're reading through John, there's almost like two applications of the book of John. You read through the book of John and you can apply it to them at that time that were Jews and the disciples. But here we are on this side looking back and we try to apply it to us. Chapter 15 is a great example of something that was written to them that you can't really apply to us. And I'll explain that to you when we get to it. But before we do, let's start in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. Okay? Now, as we're going to get into this passage, there are people out there that say, now abide means you've got to continue in him and do what he says. And if you don't abide in Christ, then you can lose your salvation. We call these your penties. Okay? Now, is a pentagram good? No. Anything that starts with pent doesn't sound that great. Except maybe Pentecost in the Bible. But did you realize that Pentecost is a feast of the Jews? Pentecost isn't something for us today. So we have in this world what we call the Pentecostals or the Charismaniacs. Or excuse me, Charis, Charismatics. I said that wrong. Charismatics. And uh, many of those uh, and others, I'll just say and others, they believe you can lose your salvation. Can we lose our salvation according to Paul? Because Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And God revealed to Paul, once saved, always saved. We call that eternal security. And we are seeing eternal security being preached by Jesus in the book of John. And he's saying it and applying it to after he dies, it's going to be like this. Once you're saved, you have everlasting life. So the book of John does contain some things that do apply to today. But the way we know they're for today is that they're lining up with what God revealed to Paul who says he's the apostle to the Gentiles, and that Jesus revealed to him things that are for us today. Okay, do you get that? Now, a lot of people run to this chapter, John chapter 15, and they say, now this is a chapter that says you can lose your salvation. Now some of them think they can lose it. Others say, if you deny Jesus, then you can fall away and not be saved. Because they say you didn't abide in him. So they say you have to abide in him to be saved. And you say, really, what does abide mean? They say, continue. Well, I went to the 1828 dictionary, and abide means to rest, to dwell, to remain, to wait for, to hope for, and to remain. So it has many different definitions. So they're just choosing the one they want to prove their doctrine if they think you can lose it. But it also says to endure. Hmm. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22. There's your kingdom gospel. Matthew 10, 22. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, look what it says. Matthew 10, 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Every time you see in the Bible, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. You know what that is? That's the kingdom gospel. That's the gospel of right here. Because right here was the same as right here before the change. Because it was God dealing with the Jews. And in the tribulation, God goes back to dealing with the Jews. So here is your message to the Jews. So he that endureth to the end shall be saved. That's the tribulation message. That's not the message of today. Today is when you're saved, you're always saved because you're eternally secure in Christ and the Comforter abides with you forever. Chapter 14. So how do you read chapter 14 where it says the Comforter abides in you forever and then you, you read chapter 15 and you say, but now you can lose it. Well, if he doesn't abide in you forever, then God just lied. Is God a liar? No. So John chapter 14, in verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So he's going to endure with you, he's going to continue with you, he's going to remain in you forever. 
dwell in you forever, according to the definition of the word. They don't want to go to that verse that proves you can't lose salvation. They want to come to one chapter and try to say, now this chapter says if you don't abide in Christ, you can lose your salvation. No. You're taking that out of context. And you're twisting that. So let's go at that and let's look at that. I want you to see that and what it's saying. First of all, he is speaking to the early disciples. Jesus had not died yet. We just read the Last Supper. And now... Jesus is about to die. And Jesus is telling them, abide in me. Why? Because he has something for them to do after he rises from the dead. But what happens next in this book? Spoiler alert. Jesus goes out and prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. The other apostles, or, or disciples, are with him. And they all scatter when Judas shows up. They didn't abide in him, did they? And one of them denies him three times. We saw that in the end of chapter 13. 38, Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So here is Peter. And what does Peter do? He doesn't abide in him. <laughs> because Peter denies Jesus three times. Okay, so with that in context, as we're reading this chapter, John chapter 15, he's telling them to abide in him. And then after he dies, go out and serve him. So abide in him and not forsake him, and yet they all forsake him, except for John. So I do not see here in John chapter 15 him saying, abide in me for salvation, and if you don't abide and you choose to deny me, you lose your salvation. Now, why am I talking like this? Because for years I've run into people, they're called Pentecostals, Charismatics, many others, that say they believe you can lose your salvation if you choose to walk away from Jesus. And you say, really? Where's that in the Bible? They say, well, John chapter 15, if you don't abide in Him, then you're no longer saved. And in their mind, they believe that salvation is not by faith alone in Christ Jesus, trusting what He did. It's what you do. So they have a works gospel, and they're wrong. Now, Monday of this week, as, as I do this, I had to do what's called a debate, I guess. A young man in, up in New York someplace asked me to come and go to a Pentecostal thing and try to show them salvation through faith alone and eternal security in Christ. And he said, I'd do it, but I, I'm afraid I, I don't know enough Bible, so would you do it? And I didn't want to. I didn't really want to, but I said, okay. And I did. And uh, I went there and showed them verses after verses, and they refused to listen to rightly dividing. They would not understand Paul. I mean, they, they laughed me to scorn. What do you mean? The gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of Paul are two different gospels. They didn't understand that. Jesus came only the lost sheep of the house of Israel to the Jews. And so I hardly got a word in edgewise, but I tried to show them that once you're saved, you're always saved according to Paul in this dispensation. They tried to go to John chapter 15 and tried to make that their basis of, nope, you got to abide or you lose it. Okay, well, I'm so glad that happened because here we are and this is the chapter we come to. So I'm hoping those guys will watch this and get saved because I came to the conclusion that they're not saved. All they did was holler, yell, wouldn't even let me speak. I finally just had to say, you know what, if you can't reason with an unreasonable person, I'm not wasting my time. I gave you all the verses that show that God said He will dwell with you forever. And uh, the Bible says He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He said, if you deny Him, He cannot deny Himself. Because we are in Him and He is in us. And I just went through the verses and they chose to not believe what the Bible says. So, I want to start out with the definition of abide. Abide means to rest or dwell or continue or to remain or to wait for or to be prepared for or to endure. And so Jesus is telling the disciples, this side of the cross, you need to abide in me. Why? Because he's about to die. And he wants them to stay together because after he dies, he wants to send them out. What do they do? They all scatter. So they didn't abide in him, did they? <laughs> did they lose their salvation? Well, we saw last time, they didn't quite have the Spirit in them yet because he says, and shall be in you. So did they even have the Holy Spirit? So this is clearly before the cross, and the dispensation of the New Testament starts when? 
at the death of the cross. It says through the death of a testator. So as we get into this, uh, I want you to see what it's saying. So with all that context come together, let's get started. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Remember, Jesus said, I am, I am, and there's seven different I am's in this book. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Who's the ye at this passage? That's them at that time. Now we get saved through the word of God, but we're also saved through the blood, and we're clean through the blood of Jesus. So the blood had to be shed for us to be clean. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Well, amen. But you see, it's not just me abiding in Jesus. A Jesus abides in me when I'm saved. So if we're going to apply it to today, I am in Christ, and Christ is in me. He said, I'll never leave thee for, nor forsake thee. So if he's dwelling in me, how can he leave? Well, you could say, I don't want you. Please get out. Uh, Ephesians 1.13 says, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 4.30 says, you're sealed to the day of redemption. Uh, no, that doesn't work. The Bible says, though we deny him, he cannot deny himself because we are of his body, members of his body. We are sons of God when we're saved. When we're saved, we are sons. We're born again. How can you get unborn again? And I told these guys that, and they just laughed. But the Bible teaches that when you're saved, it's like being born again. The first time you get born, you're born. Okay? Do you realize you can't get unborn? You can't make up your mind, well, I don't want to abide being born. I don't want to be your son. I choose to move to the other side of the world to Russia and, and change my name to Igor Patrushkovsky or something. And guess what? Now I'm no longer your son. Well, we've got a problem. Your father is still your father, and you're still a son. doesn't matter. It's already happened. It's already been a birth. Unchangeable. When you get saved, you're born again of God. John 1, 12. It's unchangeable. You can't get unborn again. You're born of the Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit inside you. You can't lose that. You are always saved. Once saved, always saved is the Bible doctrine. Now, those guys would say stuff like, well, what if you did this sin? What if you did that sin? What if you did this sin? You can't be saved. Um, so the blood of Jesus Christ does not cleanse from all sin? The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sins. So I'm going to go through and show you some more verses on this, eternal security here, in a moment. But I want you to get a hold of the context here as well. Verse... Uh, Six, here's where they go. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. So they say, if, if this, if that, if that. Well, you know what? I don't believe in a conditional salvation. I don't believe God said, if you're saved. The Bible talks about when you're saved. When you're saved through the blood of Jesus, you are cleansed from all sins. Even the sin of unbelief. So how would they say that? Well, they're going here and pulling this out of context. Before Christ died, when he's writing and speaking to these apostles saying, Hey, you guys abide in me. And it's written to the Jews because he's still going to the Jews. So it's abide in him here. So I don't see this applying to church age doctrine of you can lose your salvation if you don't abide in Christ. But that's what these people want to do. Okay, they can help themselves, but... They're forgetting the other verses, especially in the last chapter where it says when you're saved, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will abide in you forever. So you don't abide in Him, no matter, He's still abiding in you. When you're saved, He's in you. You say, well, I'm not going to abide in you anymore. I, I reject you. I don't. He's still in you because He said forever. If the Holy Spirit comes out, guess what? Then God is a liar. Is Jesus Christ a liar? Forever doesn't mean forever for Jesus Christ. Is that how that works? Eternal security. Do you know what the word eternal means? Eternal means forever and unchangeable. Changeable. I don't know if I spelled that right. Unchangeable. So if you have eternal life, if you're saved, then it can't change. It's forever. If you're saved and you do like these guys say and say, I choose not to abide, I don't want to be saved anymore, and the Holy Spirit leaves you, then God has lied in the Bible because he didn't abide with you forever. 
when it says in John chapter 14 and verse 16 that he will abide with you forever. So either God's the liar, and I don't believe that because the Bible says God cannot lie, or they are the liars who are deceiving people and twisting the scripture to preach their false doctrine of you can lose itism. No, it's once saved, always saved is the true doctrine because words have meanings and forever means forever. So when you're saved, when you're truly saved, you're saved forever. So continue reading here in John chapter 15. Verse uh, 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So you guys need to abide in me. I'm about to die. You're about to be spread out. You need to make sure you come back. Make sure you abide with him after he rises from the dead. You can make up your mind. You're going to stick with Christ. Okay? Because one of these guys doubted and didn't want to. But then he finally came around. Old Doubting Thomas. Verse uh, 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I, Jesus, have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, Jesus calls them his friends. So he's saying he's going to lay down his life for them. Hmm, that's an interesting thing. Jesus is saying, I'm dying for you, the Jews. Had the Jews accepted him, he would have set up his millennial kingdom then. And then Gentiles would have got saved. But because the Jews rejected Jesus, then God had to call Paul to go out and teach something to the Gentiles for them to get saved. But that kingdom was dependent upon whether or not the children of Israel abided in the Father. Notice all the talk about the Father and the Son and their one. The Jews back then, they called their God their Father God. Abba. Abba. Father. So the Jews believed their God was Abba. And Jesus is saying, but I am one with him. I'm Abba here in, in the flesh. And uh, you need to believe in me because I'm God. That doesn't make three gods. That's still one God. And so he's telling the Jews, you need to abide in Abba. Well, did they? No. The book of Acts talks about how they rejected the Father. How sad is that? So verse 14, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. So let me back up a little bit. Jesus is the vine, all right? Now, I'm not very good at drawing vines, but you know what a vine tree is, right? In the Bible, there's actually vine trees, and there's grape vines. And a lot of times, grape vines are, are put along fences with posts, and they put these posts up, and they let the vines go out and grow. Well, the Bible talks about Israel as a fig tree. And uh, it talks about how they were cut off, and yet there was something grafted in and something that grew in and then the Jews will be grafted back in. So he's talking about a vine and being cut off of a vine and things like that. Where is anything even remotely close to that in Paul? Romans chapter 11. How the Jews were cut. How about John the Baptist when he says the axe is laid at the root of the tree? That's Israel! <laughs> Jesus is telling Israel, man, you're a tree that's growing up, and I'm coming, and I am the tree, and you need to stay in me. Otherwise, I'm going to cut the tree down. So, people trying to take this out of context and try to say that Jesus is telling someone, if you don't abide in him, you lose your salvation, they have no understanding of the Bible and of what they're saying. This clearly has to do with more of a Jewish thing. This is not speaking of today in the church age under the doctrine of Paul, us losing our salvation. This is almost sounding like a works gospel. You've got to keep these commandments, verse 12. and, and uh, We're not under the commandments today, we're under grace. So you've got to watch out for that. Paul says, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we continue reading here in verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Who is he literally speaking to in context? The early disciples and to the Jews. And how they need to remain in him and bear fruit to him as a nation and in the disciples as his disciples. Okay? 
These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Ooh, the world hates them. Now, again, I said it before and I'll say it again. There is a double application of the book of John. Just as we looked in our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study how there's a double application in Peter, a double application in, in uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Everything that we read in the Bible today, we have to always take it back to Paul. Because we are under the ministry of Paul and the revelations and the mysteries given to Paul by Jesus. So we are following Jesus today by following Paul. Because Jesus came to the Jews and told them certain things. They rejected him. The tree was cut off. Now God says, now Paul, go out in the Gentiles and you preach this. So the heart of New Testament doctrine is the Pauline epistles. Now I believe that the early apostles got on board with the doctrines of Paul and accepted them. That's why when we go to 1 Peter, we see the message of the blood atonement in the first chapter, being redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. We go to 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, we see a lot of things. Propitiation, that's what Paul said. So we see the apostles accepting the doctrine of Paul. But what we're reading here is doctrine to the Jews, and the majority of that is applying to them then. Now, we read something that we can look at and go, huh, well maybe we could make a dual application. Because there's, like we've seen, there's some stuff in the book of John that Jesus says that does apply over here. He's foreshadowing it. He's foretelling it's going to be like this over here. You're going to get saved over here. Eventually, he's telling you this is how it's eventually going to be, to where you get the comforter and it abides or dwells in you forever. Okay? So... What we're about to read here, a lot of preachers have used this, and, and I don't have a problem with them making a spiritual application of this to the church, that how today the world hates us. When we're saved as Christians, the world hates us. But who has the world hated the most? <laughs> who did Hitler put in concentration camps and kill in, in, gas, uh, um, in gas chambers and then burn in ovens? Who has known the most hatred in the world of all people. Who was kicked out of Europe in, in 1492? Who has been kicked out of Israel in 70 AD and had to wander the earth? The Jews. So when Jesus is saying this, he's literally saying they will hate you, the world. Who is he speaking to? He's, he's speaking to his Jewish disciples. So yeah, we can apply it to the church. The world hates Christians. But it's the Jews that have been hated the most. But we can make a spiritual application to us, but as we read the book, literally, it's Jesus talking to Jews, and Jews are the ones that have been the most hated in all the world. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. It doesn't say, shall hate you. He's talking to his Jewish disciples and saying, the world hates you that are Jewish. Yes, we can make a spiritual application of us. The world hates us too. But he's literally saying to those Jews, the world's going to hate you. You're a tree that's going to be cut off. And so it's applying to Israel. So it's, there's a dual application to Israel and to the church. And we have to understand that dual application. And we've got to see it through the eyes of Paul, who is our apostle. Nobody here is losing their salvation. The Jews need to abide in their Messiah. And we find in the book of Acts, they don't. So there you go. All right, verse 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Who is Jesus Christ? The Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Who got the persecution first? Persecution, persecution, be nice if I knew how to spell. First, according to the book of Acts, was the Jews. The Jews were being persecuted. In 70 AD, they were persecuted by Rome and kicked out. So I see this talking about the Jews. And I don't see this as John 15 saying, abiding in Christ means if you don't abide in him, you lose salvation. I don't see that. I see him telling the Jews they need to abide in their Messiah. And that just makes sense. Now, if you want to make a spiritual application of that, 
you got a problem. It doesn't work and it doesn't jive with the teaching of Paul. How can Paul say one thing and Jesus say another? The only way that works out is if it's two different dispensations. And if you recognize when Jesus came, he said, I came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he's teaching the kingdom gospel. Now, some of the stuff in the book of John is him telling you, and in the future it's going to be like this. So some of it we can apply to the church. But some of the stuff that he's saying in the book of John, he's saying this to the Jews and to Israel, and he's saying to right then. So this is why it is so important to rightly divide. And the most important thing you need to know is Galatians chapter 1. Paul says that he was revealed a gospel, not by men, but by Jesus Christ. And the gospel revealed to him was the gospel of what Jesus did. And it's the gospel of faith in the blood. And he's teaching what God did for you is what saves you. Trust in what God did. This over here is the message of who he is. So Jesus, who is Jesus? He's the vine. Who is Jesus? He's the bread. Who, the whole book of John is about who Jesus is. And so it's that message of the who, not yet the message of the what. Okay, I get dogmatic about this because I want people to know the truth. Now, 1 John 3.13, John makes a spiritual application to the church. He says, marvel not if the world hate you. So he remembers what Jesus said to the Jews then, and he takes it, and later in his life he says, hey, marvel not that the world hateth you. So see how you can? It's not wrong to make a dual application, but it's got to match up with the revelations given to Paul. God can't contradict himself. So that's why you have to be able to rightly divide. Now, verse. Um, let's go back to verse, uh, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I have said unto you. So we have some hate here. And uh, let's go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3, 13. Marvel not my brethren if the world hates you. Okay. Why would the world hate you? Well, why did the world hate the Jews? Because the devil knew that that was God's chosen people, so the devil has been active since God chose Abraham, attacking that nation. Now when we get saved today, we are God's people. We are the sons of God. And the devil's going to attack us. What do they attack you on? Well, John chapter 3 and verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Now back up. Verse 12, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Verse 14, We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Salvation is when we get saved. When we get saved, we're in Christ. He abides in us, the Comforter, forever. And when we're in him, we should love one another, not hate one another. And when we get saved, it says right there, you have passed, have passed. From death unto life. Death unto life. What is eternal life? Now this is something these guys got into uh, in my little debate there. They said eternal life we don't have when we get saved. We get it when we die. And I just thought to myself, you lying devils. You will not listen to the scripture. The Bible says that when you're saved, you have eternal life. Let's go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. And it was just sad to me and laughable that these people brought up this argument and they couldn't even defend it. And yet they tried to make me look like I didn't know what I was talking about. And I just kind of went, you guys don't even see the most basic doctrine of Old Testament New Testament. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.16 says... Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So you believe on him to life everlasting. When you believe on him, you get everlasting life. Let's go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Romans 6, 23, look what it says. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is a free gift that you receive, and that free gift is eternal life. Now, when you get that free gift, what is that free gift? That free gift is life for all eternity, which is unchangeable and forever, so it can't change. These guys were saying, well, you can deny him and not abide in him and give up a free gift. Uh, how do you give up a free gift of eternal life and the Holy Spirit dwelling in you forever? 
if you say, God, I don't want you anymore, leave, is he going to go, oh, well, I said I'd stay forever, but you're right, okay, I'll leave. If he leaves, he just lied. Because he said he's going to stay there forever. Is God a liar? My God's not a liar, but your God is, if you teach you can lose it. Because he said he gives you eternal life. If he takes that away, or if you say, well, I give it up, I don't want it anymore, and you lose it, guess what you've just done? You've called God a liar. Because the Bible says it's everlasting life. It's forever. It can't be changed. It can't be lost. Otherwise, it wasn't forever. It's that simple. I mean, do their brains even work, these people? Let's look at a lot of verses. Can you lose your salvation? Of course not. Not in this dispensation. Now, in the tribulation, maybe. But not today. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 7. I'm going to just go and show you some verses on this, because we have some time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. And secretly, I'm hoping these guys will watch this and get saved. Because I came to the conclusion that these guys were not saved. Because they thought your salvation was dependent on what you did. They made it a faith plus works gospel. If you're thinking you've got to do something to keep your salvation, then you're not saved. Because you're trying to add to what Jesus did. You're basically saying what Jesus did wasn't enough. Now it's dependent upon me. So you're the co-savior now? Either he's the savior that saves you and keeps you till the end, or you are the one that saves yourself. It can't be both. Because he is the only savior who said he's going to abide with you forever. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful. Even if we're not, God is faithful. He said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Boy, that, that thrills my heart. I know that I'm safe, because he'll never leave me, nor forsake me. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Wow, he is faithful. If he saves you, he's faithful to keep you saved to the end. Second Corinthians, not dependent upon what you do or don't do. It's what he did for you and whether you trust that or not. And when you believe, you're eternally secure in Him. It's called eternal redemption. If you could deny Him and lose it, you couldn't get it back. The only way would be He'd have to die on the cross all over again. Is He going to do that? Is He going to die all over again on the cross to save you? No. It's one sacrifice forever, the Bible says. And it's for all trespasses, for all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. What was the good thing? Well, it was his uh, being ordained, and it was the teachings, and it was the things that he gave him. It's not saying here, you can lose it. It's saying the Holy Ghost dwells in you. How long does He dwell there? Until you sin? Until you give up and say, I don't want it anymore? Until you deny Him? Because you don't abide in Him anymore? No, He said in the chapter before chapter 15, and when you're saved, the Holy Spirit abides in you forever. So if you fall into sin, you can lose, lose rewards in heaven, but you can't lose salvation. Uh, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 18. 2 Timothy 4.18 And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. See, it's God that's preserving you, not you preserving yourself. Ephesians 1.13 says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21 and 22 talks about being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 4.30 says we're sealed till the day of redemption. The day of redemption is the rapture. So my soul is saved and the Holy Spirit is in me and it's the Holy Spirit that takes me up at the rapture so I cannot lose salvation I don't want to try <laughs> one old preacher said you can't lose it if you try well I don't say that because I don't want people to try I don't want people to sin the Bible tells us not to sin there's some people out there that want to sin I don't I'm against sin 
I think people shouldn't sin. But it's not whether or not you sinned that means you're going to heaven. It's whether or not you have believed. And if you have trusted in the finished work of Christ, then you're a son, a son of God, according to John chapter 1 and verse 12. Now the question is, are you a good son or are you a bad son? Are you pleasing their father or not? You're not going to lose salvation, but you're certainly lose rewards in heaven and joy down here and your testimony and other things. So you shouldn't sin if you're saved. John chapter 13, verse 15, That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Hath everlasting life. When you're saved, you have eternal life. Your soul is eternally saved and eternally quickened. You know, there's a term in the Bible, quickened. When we're saved, we're quickened. That means brought to life. That's not our body. Our body hasn't been quickened yet. That happens at the rapture. So when we're saved, God saves the soul. It's at the rapture that our body gets saved. And our body can sin. It shouldn't, but it can. And we're supposed to keep that body in check. But these guys I was debating, they were saying, no, no, you don't get eternal life until you die. And I took them to these verses. It was like they were blind, folks. You would read a verse, and it was like it went bloop, bloop, in one ear and out the other. They couldn't see it. That made me realize these people are lost because they're not listening to what God says. Look at what God says in John chapter 5 and verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is Jesus Christ, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Hath. Has. We would say today, has. So hath everlasting life. Has everlasting life. Present tense. Has. That means I have eternal life right now. I, Robert Breaker. How do I lose that if I already have it? You can't. And it says here, in, um, in this passage, hath everlasting life, comma, and shall not come unto condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And they say, no, you shall come unto condemnation. You have not passed from death unto life. And I'm reading the Bible, and it says, you shall not come into condemnation, but you have passed from death unto life. Why are they saying the opposite of what the Bible says? They must be lost. John chapter 10, verse 27. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Listen to that. And they shall never perish. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Actually, it was verse 16 I wanted. So verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. That's chapter 14. Chapter 15, Jesus says, abide in me. Okay, abide in Jesus. But know that if you're saved today, he abides in you. What happens if you stop abiding in him? What does that even mean? Whether you're serving him or not, you're still his son and you're still saved. Let's say you don't do a horrible sin. Well, that's where the thing comes in. Well, there are certain sins if a guy does that he can't still be saved. Now you're the judge and jury, are you? Now you know who is saved and who's not? Now you're telling me because a man does this, that, or the other thing, he's no longer a Christian? Is that how it works? So the blood of Jesus does not cleanse from all sins? Is that what you're... You see, my father was Robert Breaker. He was the junior. I'm the third. I'm Robert Breaker. I am capable in this flesh of doing the most hideous and heinous things. What if I went out and murdered 50 people? Cut up their bodies like Jeffrey Dahmer, kept them in the refrigerator, did, did sick and twisted things on them. Would I still be saved? Well, if I'm saved, yes. Should I do that? No. I don't see how I would do that. With the Holy Spirit in me, I wouldn't want to do that. But could I lose my salvation because I did something that horrible? Well, that was extreme, wasn't it? Well, am I still Robert Breaker? Yeah. I'd go to jail, and they'd put the name Robert Breaker. 
because I'm still the son of my father, even though I did those horrible things. Same thing with salvation. If I did so such a heinous, horrible crime, and God forbid I would do anything like that, I don't want to even think about doing things like that, but God forbid I should do something like that. Even if I did something that horrible, guess who my father still is? God in heaven who saved me. And I will lose a testimony down here and lose rewards in heaven, but you cannot lose the Holy Spirit, the Comforter that dwells in you forever. And that's a good thing because the Bible says that when you sin, it grieves the Holy Spirit. I don't see how a Christian could even do something that bad. If someone did that, I would question if they were saved to begin with. I would never say they lost it. I would say, I don't think you ever had it. Because the Bible teaches when you're saved, you can't lose it. Now, there's a lot more verses we can go to. Let's go to um, 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, these fellows, they want to think that there is a, a time or a situation or a sin or there's something that you can do that if you do that, oh, you're no longer saved. That's a problem, and that's someone that doesn't understand what salvation even is. It's sonship. It's a sealing. It's a receiving, a free gift forever of having the Holy Spirit in you, and you can't lose it. You are in Him, and He is in you. The Bible says we're part of the body of Christ, and we get saved. If you can lose it, then God's up in heaven cutting His body up. That doesn't make sense. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again in the lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Kept by faith. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Here's a good one. Oh, they wanted to run to Romans chapter 8, but they didn't want to read this. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate. To be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. When you're saved, now you're one of the called. And God, in His infinite mercy and grace and knowledge and love, said that whoever trusts Me they will be conformed to the image of my Son. They will go to heaven. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors. What does that mean? That means I can't lose it. That means I've conquered death because I have eternal life. And no matter what happens to me, my body's going to raise again at the resurrection and be glorified. And my soul is going to go to heaven because my soul belongs to God. We are more than conquerors through Christ. I do not see anywhere in the Bible where you can lose your salvation. So this argument, oh, John 15 teaches if you don't abide in Him, you lose it. No, no. That's a weak, weak argument. When there's a mountain of verses that say, once we're saved, we're eternally secure in Christ. Let's go ahead and read verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So back to John chapter 15. I hope you get that. I've done everything I could to try to show you that there is no losing your salvation in the church age. Jesus before he died, gave lots of verses like John 3.16 and all those, John 5, about how over here when you get saved, you get eternal life and you can't lose it. That's where we are today, is right here. And the Bible teaches you cannot lose the free gift of eternal life because it's a gift of you are going to be saved forever. If it wasn't that and you could get rid of it or say I don't want it anymore or lose it, then God lied because it wasn't forever. 
And so if you're saying you can lose it, then you are calling God a liar. And you are making yourself into the greatest liar that's ever lived. And I want nothing to do with you. I want to run from you. I feel sorry for you. Here's, here's another one. Now let's go to Galatians chapter um, 5. They would run over here to Galatians chapter 5. And the more verse I showed them, the less they listened. <laughs> the more they yelled. And I told them, look, you don't win an argument because you yell the loudest. If you want to listen, I'll read. If not, I think it's time I need to go. And I finally had to just say bye-bye. I don't want anything to do with people that just want to scream and holler. It sounded like demons is what they sounded like. Demons hate the blood of Christ and how it can forgive of all sins. But in Galatians chapter 5, they ran over here to this verse. In verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Okay, It starts out in verse 19, a list of the works of the flesh. And of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And they said, see, see, if you do these things, then you don't inherit the kingdom of God. And I thought for a minute, I thought, man, you guys don't even read your Bible, do you? The kingdom of God is within us, it says in the book of Luke. When we get saved, we get the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, that's the kingdom of God in us. The Bible says the kingdom of God is in you. And the kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. When we're saved, we've got the kingdom of God. So if a saved person does one of these sins, he's still saved because he's already inherited it through faith. They're saying, if you do these things, then you won't inherit it. How do you inherit something that you already have? That makes no sense to me. But they want to say that if you do those sins, well, then you don't inherit the kingdom of God. To them, that's something you get later. You don't get it when you get saved. That just proved to me that they didn't even have salvation. And they said many things like that. No, you don't have eternal life right now. That's what you get at the end of your life if you endure to the end, if you abide. No, the Bible says we have passed from death unto life. We are saved and have eternal life when we believe. We do have the Holy Spirit in us that can't leave. So that just, the Lord solidified to me, those men are not even saved. And they're twisting the scriptures to their own destruction. I was so sad to hear that. So, verse uh, 19, John 15, 19. If you are of the world, the world will love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. And that's a shame that the world would hate you. Verse 20, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Hmm. So keep the saying of Jesus. Now, there is some persecution that takes place. Um, the Jews will go through persecution in the tribulation. Let's turn over and read that. Matthew chapter 10. So again, we can make a double application of this book. Literally, he's speaking to Jews right then. Spiritually, we can try to apply that to the church. Yes, we in the church age can go through some persecution. But Jesus is talking to the Jews right then about, hey, you Jews need to abide in me. So the literal... Uh, interpretation, the literal um, speaking of what he's talking about is Jews enduring persecution. And look what it says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Yeah, there are a lot of wolves out there. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for the testimony against them and the Gentiles. Hmm. Who's getting persecuted here? Jews, before the Gentiles. Let me, before I read the rest of this, <laughs> I forgot to tell you. The young man who asked me to do that debate said the debate was going to be on a, a little computer program called Discord. <laughs> I thought to myself, you want me to go to something called Discord and, and, and do a debate on that? The Bible says we're not supposed to sow Discord among brethren. And yet that's what that whole thing was, is them sowing discord and bringing out false doctrine and trying to deceive people with false doctrine. I thought that was funny. Discord, what a funny thing. But it says there in verse 19, But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. 
and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. This is Matthew 24. Jesus says that in Matthew 24, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. How do we know that that's the tribulation period? Because in Matthew chapter 24, it says in verse 13, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. That's the kingdom message, the kingdom gospel. Verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Are you telling me that's for us today in our dispensation? Do you mean I have to buy a ticket to Israel and I have to flee into the mountains of Israel and I have to uh, endure to the end to be saved in Israel? No! That's Jesus speaking to the Jews when they get into the tribulation period. They have to endure to the end to be saved in that dispensation. We're in this dispensation. Things different are not the same. Now, if we want to make a spiritual application of this in John chapter 15, of Christians being persecuted, well, what does 2 Timothy 3.12 say? Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We suffer for Jesus today. The Jews have suffered because they did not abide in their Messiah. How sad. We have it made when we get saved because we are in Him and He's abiding in us through the Holy Spirit. I don't have to worry about if I abide in Him or not because He's abiding in me. Now that's not an excuse to go sin, but it certainly is peace of mind. It makes me feel joy and peace and happiness and love knowing that He's in me forever. And He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. John chapter 15 verse 21, But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent him. Okay, well who is that? For my name's sake. By the way, what is his name's sake? The name of Jesus is what? The name of Jesus is a compound word. Jesus. And it's divided into two. J is short for Jehovah. Sus is saves. So the name of Jesus is the name of Jehovah. Jehovah saves. So the Jehovah, the name Jehovah, is actually in the name Jesus. So the Father's name is in the name of the Son as well. That's so amazing. And it says here, verse 22, If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak in their sin. Who is this they that he's talking about? When I was younger, my dad was a substitute teacher. My mom was a substitute teacher. My dad was a teacher in English. And when I'd come to dad and I'd say things like, well, they did this and they did that, my dad would say, who is this nebulous they? <laughs> He'd say, son, your pronouns have no antecedents. Who are they? Your pronouns must have antecedents for me to understand what you're saying. So who is they that he's talking about? Well, Jesus knows what's happening right now. Several chapters back, Judas left to go out and get soldiers and priests and, and people like that to come against Jesus. So Jesus knows that they're coming to get him, and he's speaking about them and the nation of Israel and saying they. So who is this they? They would be the Pharisees that chose not to accept Jesus Christ. That's the context of the book and the context of what we're seeing. They that hated me hateth my father also. Clearly the Pharisees is who he's talking about. The Pharisees that sought to kill him, right? So the Pharisees were the religious leaders in that day who turned the people against the very God whom they claimed to worship. Wow. And they're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're the false prophets. And it says here, verse 24, If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my Father. Yep, they sure did. Now verse 25, But this come at the pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. Here Jesus goes and quotes scripture again. And that scripture that Jesus quotes is a scripture that points to him. And where is that found? That's found in Psalms chapter 35 and verse 19. Psalms 35, 19. And look what it says in Psalms 35, 19. It's always fun to go back and look at the scripture that they say is being fulfilled. Psalms 35, 19. 
Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. There they are hating him without a cause. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eye hath seen it. <laughs> oh, do you remember what happened at the cross when they made fun of Jesus? And they were like, Aha, 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 aha and things like that. And yet he knew years before what was going to happen. Go back to John chapter 15. But this coming to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. Verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye shall also bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. So Jesus again refers to the Holy Spirit as the Comforter. And uh, I didn't write it up here, did I? Last time, last time we did a teaching and put it up here. So the Comforter is the Holy Spirit. Comforter has come, the Comforter has come. Great, great old hymn. So the Comforter is Jesus. And verse 27 is quite amazing. And I've got to finish because we've gone a little bit long. But these are called the Apostles. So we have the Apostles. Jesus is speaking to the Apostles here before he has died. And tells them, y'all need to abide in me. Is he telling us who are Christians, abide in him to be saved? I don't see that. I see him telling them. I see him also, in context, telling the Pharisees and the nation of Israel, you need to abide in me, or else you're going to have problems. And we see that they didn't, they killed him. And then when he gave them a chance by the preaching of the apostles going out, they still didn't want anything to do with Jesus. And so God cut him off. And then came Paul. And God said, now take it to the Gentiles, they'll get saved. Now Jews can still get saved too, but they've got to come through the gospel of Paul. So let's close with this. This was the apostles, and notice what it says in verse 27. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. In order for them to witness what they saw, they had to be with Jesus from the beginning. And the apostles were all there from the beginning. So in order to be an apostle... In the Bible, one would have had to have been a witness of Jesus from the beginning. And let me show you why that's so important, because today there's out there people saying, I'm an apostle. And when they say that, I just laugh. Because do you know in the Bible, there are no apostles today? The apostles were those 12 that were chosen. One was a devil, and he got booted out. And then God brought in another. Now, was Matthias one of them? Well, they chose Matthias, but it sounds like God didn't choose Matthias. Jesus chose Paul. But in uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 15, you start reading there, where Peter stood up. And he's beginning to speak, verse 16, Men and brethren, for sake of time, I won't read all of this, but the whole thing is talking about, from verse 15 all the way to 26, about, hey, we're missing an apostle. We need to choose one. So, verse 23, they appointed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, and they go on and they choose this one. But what was it that a person had to have, or be, or, or what was it that, that would make a person apostle? It's very clear in this context that you had to have been a witness from the time of John up until then. And you could only be an apostle in that day if you had been there from the beginning, like Jesus just said. And we see that in verse 21 and 22. Wherefore, these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So you had to have seen Jesus starting with the ministry of John the Baptist, until that's written. And if you, Johnny, come lately, you came later, and you didn't get to see all that, you couldn't have been an apostle, is what it's saying. And that's what Jesus just said. And you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at what it says. It says, there came along some people later, in Paul's day, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and by the way, God chose Paul as the apostle, born out of season, and he's called the apostle to the Gentiles. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 and, and 14 and 15, 
2 Corinthians 11, 13, we read, For such are false apostles, hmm, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. There are false apostles in the Bible. And this is about 60 A.D. So let's go over to Revelation chapter 2. So 60 A.D., there's people standing up saying, well, I'm a real apostle. And they said, no, no, you're not. You're a false apostle. So the only true apostles were the ones that started and saw the ministry of John the Baptist and saw that all the way past to the resurrection of Jesus. You could only be an apostle if you were during that time. Here we have the book of Revelation written about 95, 96 A.D., and look what it says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2, the church of Ephesus. Revelation 2, 2, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. So, an apostle has to start over here with John. And the only way that you can be an apostle is if you started here, and you went from here to here. And you can only be chosen as an apostle if you were a witness of these things from here to here. And Paul saw all that. And God chose him because he was there too. And made him the apostle to the Gentiles. So are there apostles today? No. No, there's only 12 apostles, and I'm not going to read it. But if you want to read the book of Revelation, go to the book of Revelation. It says there about the... Um, the um, New Jerusalem, it says the 12 foundations of the 12 apostles. If there were more apostles, it would say the 800 uh, foundations of the 12. No. So God only chose 12. One was a devil. Then another showed up. And I don't think that other one's going to be Matthias because we never hear about him ever more in the Bible. All we hear about is Paul. And so when I read my Bible, I read what the Bible teaches and I follow it. And I go to John chapter 15, and we read it in context. I do not see John 15 applying to the church age, saying, if you don't abide in Christ, you lose your salvation. That's a lie from a pits of hell. And you know what somebody told me about those people in that little debate that I did? said they were Pentecostals, and they claimed to be apostles. I said, what? He said, yeah, they claim to be apostles. I said, so they're liars about this. And now... They're false apostles as well. That's sad. That's sad. The Bible says that the signs are for the Jews. And those were called the signs of the apostles. And the Jews would not believe without a sign. Paul says we live by faith and not by sight. We don't have signs today to believe. We believe because it's written, not because we need a sign to believe it. So as a Bible believer, I thank God that he's given me the truth and that I won't fall into error. Amen? I'm so thankful that I'm not going to follow these uh, liars and fall into their false doctrine. I'm so thankful that I have the true doctrine of salvation by grace through faith in the blood of Christ and once saved, always saved. And I just want you to have that same doctrine. I want you to know the truth and I want you to be happy and joyful in the Lord knowing that you can't lose salvation. And I hope, oh man, I hope that I did a good job there explaining John chapter 15. Again, a passage in the scripture that many try to go to and say, that teaches you can walk away from Jesus. If you don't abide in him, you lose it. No, that was uh, Jesus talking to the early disciples and talking to the Jews, saying, hey, you all need to abide in me or else. And guess what? They didn't. And so the or else was 2,000 years wandering in the wilderness as a nation before they finally came back. And God's not done with those Jews. He's going to deal with them again. All right, God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.